One of the main problems of the so-called African American is that they have yet to understand the system of white supremacy. This is why statements like Thine Itemus or incidences even like Trayvon Martin will receive so much support from the black community, while at the same time young black male incarceration exceeds the number of enslaved blacks in 1850. We have been classified by most people as a reactionary people, meaning that we only deal with racism on a surface level and we have yet to explore the inner workings of a system designed for the preservation of the people who classify themselves as white or European. With that being the case, what I find to be even more troubling is that when one addresses a particular issue, such as the CIA bringing drugs into the black community, we hear statements like, well, nobody made them sell the drugs, without addressing the reason why the CIA would aid and abet chemical warfare into the black community. In this documentary, I would deal with the inner workings of the system of white supremacy and the attack on the African American male. How long does it take you to move something like this? Two days, from the grandies to the hood. Y'all smokers lovers, man. I ain't lying. ATF, fuck now. ATF, now kill them. Now if you kill them, we kill them all. We kill them Mexicans and everything. Real quick, Captain, nigga. I ain't hiding behind no motherfucking rag, nigga. I'm in your motherfucking face, nigga. I'm Lil Debo from Compton AB, motherfucking C, nigga. You heard it, nigga, and you know who the fuck I am, nigga. Each and every one of you loud mouth, yapping ass, chucking my phone ass, bitch ass, motherfucking niggas. I got something for you, better believe it, nigga. Better believe it, nigga. Yeah. And I ain't hiding behind no motherfucking rag, nigga. You see my face, nigga, so come get this fat ass. The system of white supremacy has trained the masses into believing that a drug dealer is a young black male with his pants sagging. This illusion, this facade, has been carefully orchestrated to the point where you actually believe that the re-enslavement of African American males is actually a war on drugs. Now understand that this is systematically being done. You have the policy makers creating the laws. You have the media feeding you this negative image. While at the same time private corporations create the prisons. All working for the same purpose which will be the massive incarceration of the African-American male. Ain't nobody from outside bringing down the property value. It's these folk shooting each other and selling that crack rock and shit. Well, how you think the crack rock gets into the country? We don't own any planes. We don't own no ships. We are not the people who are flying and floating that shit in here. The president allocated another $462 million for the drug war in 1974, almost eight times the amount spent four years earlier. Despite our best efforts, illegal cocaine is coming into our country at alarming levels, and four to five million people regularly use it. A Gulfstream jet that crash-landed in Mexico in late September bearing a load of nearly four tons of cocaine was used by the CIA for trips between the U.S. and Guantanamo Bay. We must be intolerant of drug use and drug sellers. I am a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, and I work South Central Los Angeles, and I will tell you, Director Deutsch, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. There's no moral middle ground. Indifference is not an option. We want you to help us create an outspoken intolerance for drug use. For the sake of our children, I implore each of you to be unyielding and inflexible in your opposition to drugs. The truth was, was that the drug trade was a protected commercial enterprise on behalf of Wall Street, policed, run, and managed by the Central Intelligence Agency. We must be intolerant of drugs, not because we want to punish drug users, but because we care about them and want to help them. This legislation is not intended as a means of filling our jails with drug users.
And a new analysis of the U.S. prison population finds more black men are incarcerated now than were enslaved in 1850. The figures are stunning. They are sobering, eye-opening numbers. The latest estimates by the Bureau of Justice putting the number of imprisoned African-American men at more than 846,000. While black men account for roughly 6.5% of the U.S. population, they make up 40.2 percent of the prison population. And joining me now is Mark Lamont Hill, professor of education and African American studies at Columbia University and host of Our World with Black Enterprise. So Mark, it's good to have you here. Good to be here. Uh, when we talk about this, uh, it's a problem not discussed enough. Uh, however, when we talk about these sobering statistics that are out now, it really is eye-opening and I think uh, staggering for people to consider. So why is it that this country is putting away so many African American men? Do we have a definite reason for it? Well, we in a nation that's committed to punishment rather than dealing with the fundamental problems that lead to mass incarceration. Uh, in 1970, for example, we only had about 250 to 300,000 people incarcerated. Now, in 2011, we have 2.5 million people. We didn't raise a generation of criminals. We, we, we shifted public policy in such a way that it's easier to get incarcerated. The net is wider and it's deeper. Uh, we live in a nation... But wasn't that done out of noble causes to begin with? I mean, with the population growth and the fact that crimes in, in this day and age are expanding to different fronts that people probably hadn't even considered then, including technology crimes, uh, does it make a difference in how we interpret these numbers? Well, most people aren't in jail for the things like technology crimes or mm -hmm. other white-collar crimes. Most people are in jail. The prison boom comes, in fact, from the war on drugs, which begins in the mid-'80s, 1984, mm -hmm. when drug use was actually at a low. Before crack actually hits the streets, we begin a war on drugs, which really turns out to be a war on small-time drug users. Four out of five people who are incarcerated for drugs are not dealers. They're small-time users. And right. again, that's a criminalization of a medical problem. We've decided to use punishment instead of uh, social This reasons. legislation is not intended as a means of filling our jails with drug users. We're joined now from Columbus, Ohio, by Michelle Alexander, author of the new book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Her latest article exploring how the war on drugs gave birth to what she calls a permanent American undercast. It's available at TomDispatch.com. She's a former director of Racial Justice Project at the ACLU of Northern California. She now holds a joint appointment at the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University. Michelle Alexander, welcome to to democracy now, nearly half of America's young black men are behind bars or have been labeled felons for life. That's an astounding figure. Also, what does it mean in terms of their rights for the rest of their lives? Yes, thanks largely to the war on drugs, a war that has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. The war on drugs waged in these ghetto communities has managed to brand as felons millions of people of color for relatively minor, nonviolent drug offenses. And once branded a felon, they're ushered into a permanent second-class status, not unlike the one we supposedly left behind. Um, those labeled felons may be denied the right to vote, are automatically excluded from juries, and may be legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, public benefits, much like their grandparents or great-grandparents may have been discriminated against during the Jim Crow era. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. So you've been doing this for 31 years, so you must have a clear picture of what the war on drugs is doing. I think that what we see is not a war on drugs, it's a war on poor people with drug involvement and the casualties are terrible. The United States is engaged in an experiment of wholesale incarceration that is having a multi-generational impact and I think we're barely beginning to see the damage that it's doing. We have a two-tier system in this country of dealing with substance abuse. If you're white and a child of privilege, you're likely to end up in drug treatment if you have a drug problem. If you're poor and a person of color, you're likely to end up incarcerated. And it's a very, very vivid division. What we've seen is an escalation in incarceration rates. And we've seen incarceration being used at such a level of intrusion that it is, in some communities, the dominant cultural force 
in the lives of young people growing up. We've seen the prison system and the jail system in this country expand to the point where in California they now spend more on their criminal justice, on the prison system piece alone of the criminal justice system, they now spend more on that than they do on education.